so you were talking about the immunorad um, process and that there's a clinical trial coming. And I think Dr. Tycody and I have talked about that earlier this week. What are the criteria that, that need to be established to be involved with something like that? Yeah, um, the trial is still in development, so I think there are negotiations to be done with all the other branches. Um, I think right now we have a trial open already for patients with melanoma, We're hoping to expand that to a greater population. There are also patients who, you know, are not technically on the clinical trial, but in the right setting, we've occasionally, because you're allowed to receive radiation when you're receiving immunotherapy. You don't have to be on the clinical trial for that. We just want to make sure that the setting is correct, because that's kind of the effect that we go on. So, so there, there wouldn't be a, a conflict if you're currently on a clinical trial for the nivolumab uh, and, and to be involved in something like that? So there can be. It depends on. So if you're currently on a clinical trial, the trial that you're on usually has specifications for what you are and are not allowed to receive. Some allow radiation, some do not. Some require a washout period, like you can get radiated, but then you have to be off of it for, you know, two to four weeks or something. Um, it also sounds like Nivolumab, well, depending on exactly when you're receiving it, is technically a standard of care right now, clinically, for the right patient population. Okay, thank you. Is there a, a difference between proton therapy and radiation therapy, or are they one of the same? I, I debated putting a slide about proton therapy on there. I think it's a kind of radiation, but it works a little differently in that regular radiation travels through your body. So it enters one side, comes out the other side, which is why for the radio surgery, I was saying that you have to use a lot of different beams so that they converge on a spot. Proton radiation goes in your body and does not come out the other side. And so there are definitely clinical scenarios where that's a huge advantage. When I think of it, I usually think of it in terms of treating a lot of kinds of pediatric brain tumors especially for some kinds of child cancers where we treat not only the brain, but we treat their entire spine going down the back. And so with regular radiation, what happens is we shoot a beam of radiation from the back, but it exits out the front. So you treat all the organs in front of the spine. So heart, lungs, liver, not too much kidney, stomach, bowel. Proton radiation, it goes in the back and it just stops. And so you don't treat all those organs in the front. In kidney cancer, we have not been excited about using proton radiation because we've already tested the kind of low dose every day kind of radiation, which is most likely what proton radiation will be used for. And it was proven to be very questionable kind of cancer control benefit, whereas it was toxic. Proton radiation is going to be less toxic, but if it's not helping your cancer, then why would you want to receive it? Whereas for most other spots of kidney cancer treatment right now, we do more of that radial surgery that I talked about, and that is not really applicable to use proton radiation. So I debated talking about it versus not, but it's not, we're not really using it for kidney cancer. Um, I have a question. First of all, full disclosure, I am Pookie's neighbor, but I don't think I'm the guy that said she wasn't a real doctor. <laughs> Uh, I have uh, two risk factor questions I like to ask. I've noticed one of the early slides, uh, aspirin was up there as a risk factor. I do take um, low dose aspirin. And the second risk factor question would be uh, if someone could speak to contrast when used on CT scans. So in terms of the, the chronic analgesic abuse, um, I can't speak to, to threshold doses, but I would say you know, per package use of, of over-the-counter agents is totally fine. These would be patients doing strange, very high-dose, long-term use, uh, and, and the association there, this, it's a pretty uncommon phenomenon, but it's, if you search the literature and really dig hard for associations, it's out there, so I wouldn't worry about routine aspirin use. Uh, contrast agents for CT imaging, we don't have a radiologist here. Uh, we worry more about uh, toxic injury to the kidneys impairing kidney function, um, rather, more so than that being some sort of cancer risk factor. So you come out the other side from nephrectomy surgery, often having mildly abnormal kidney function, and Dr. Musinski will take that on after the lunch break in terms of speaking to about long-term kidney function and trajectory of your kidneys. Um, so we do worry about impairing kidney function with the contrast, but not really from a directly a cancer carcinogen point of view. I don't know my question is in hearing function. Right. Okay. We'll try it today. Well, since you're there now, I wondered, you just briefly mentioned that you don't really recommend omega-3 supplements mm -hmm. like fish oil and things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, and why? So I wondered why, yeah. Well, because um, really the only thing that 
uh, fish oil supplements have been shown to do is to reduce triglycerides. And they've, also, they've been shown to increase uh, risks of uh, aggressive prostate cancer from some of our researchers here at the Fred Hutch. Um, they've been shown to cause chemo resistance for some drugs, uh, some of the platinum drugs during treatment. Um, and also the source of fish oil, who knows where it's coming from, from what fish in what waters, polluted or not. Um, so I personally uh, and my colleagues um, at SCCA, we really recommend getting omega-3 fatty acids through food versus supplements. I just don't think the data is strong enough to support um, a lot of fish oil, uh, flax oil supplements. Um, in general, they're not, well, they're not harmful unless you take an awful lot of them. I mean, then they're blood thinners, and many of the supplements are, have blood thinning properties. So, so I'm not a supplement believer. I'm a food first type of a person, and I, I say that because the data just doesn't bear out the use of supplements. Okay, um, I guess this is for the panel. Um, for, for metastatic cancer, which at this point I don't think I have, who, how do you determine the calculus or the, the, the pairing of the new drugs that will come into trial? I mean, is there data that you, it seems like as you describe it, it was more like random, let's try this one with this one and then we get a trial. What are the, what is the evidence to try the different drugs and the, the, the pairing of those? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's not any sort of uh, overarching guidance or structure that would prioritize uh, and create a hierarchy about clinical trials. Right. Uh, it's dominated by uh, commercially owned compounds, and so. Uh, some of the pairing, a lot of the pairing is pragmatic. Uh, a company has new compound development, they have an old compound that works for a disease and they're going to look at A plus B from their own holdings. Uh, there is scientific insight and, and a lot of what's done hopefully is done for um, well thought out scientific endpoints. But there is a pragmatism of, of commercial agents that is also uh, comes into play. So. Yeah, I showed you a slide of three very similar clinical trials. Do you really need three studies to scientifically address whether bringing an immune checkpoint drug into first therapy is smart? No, you probably don't, but you have competing companies that own similar compounds that all want a piece of the pie. So there's not like a, a quarterback that's doing regression analysis that'll show you some type of analytics of why to make it's just pure business So no, there's no, you know, the, the NCI, NIH does not um, have some kind of uh, uh, overarching authority. Uh, they do have their hands in certain types of trials. There are cooperative networks that, that participate in some clinical research trials, but a large part of what's available is driven by free market uh, pharmaceutical enterprise. Uh, we'd like to think we, we apply a filter about what we bring into the clinic that we think it has, has scientific merit and value to the patients, so it's not completely free for all that, that you know, we're forced to open studies that we think are stupid or, or not helpful. So we try and, and you know, make things available that we believe in and think are, are helpful. But from you know, yeah, a comprehensive kind of resource utilization and cost point of view, I mean, there isn't, uh, there isn't a czar that decides what's going to be done and what won't be. Um, I guess I have uh, two questions. Um, my husband had stage four uh, cancer, um, had his kidney removed, metastasis to his lungs and his uh, lower spine. Um, at what point um, do you, and he has suffered some low back pain, what point do you consider radiation therapy to be the appropriate treatment? And then I also have a question for Linda. Um, what is your knowledge about uh, turkey tail? Um, so I'm curious your, your view on that. Thank you. So I think, you know, when I see a patient to talk about possibly doing radiation for metastatic disease, my goal is that I should hope that I'm going to help more than I'm going to harm them. 
And so, you know, for patients, if their pain is mild and it's not affecting their function, like walking, and it's well managed by pain medication, for example, then I might say, you know, these, this is what I expect are the side effects of doing the radiation, but you seem happy, so I don't necessarily know that I'm going to make you a lot happier with the treatment, and so why bother doing it? But usually when I, patients come to me, you know, they are more bothered by the pain. They're starting to have more mobility issues from the pain. And then I think, you know, it's just a matter of looking at the lesion, like I said, what exactly are the side effects of treating it, and then having a conversation. And so as far as the turkey tail mushroom, which is Coriolis mushroom, um, all mushrooms have beta-glucans, which are, um, they have positive impact on our immune system. And um, I know that turkey tail mushroom is often prescribed by naturopaths in the area. Um, it has been shown to enhance some of the chemotherapy impacts of certain drugs, which I can't recall specifically which they are right now. I don't think there's any any real danger to it. Um, I think that uh, in general mushrooms, because they are plants, they have a lot of these anti-inflammatory compounds and specifically it's the beta-glucans that um, improve our immune system and, and again, that's kind of the role of nutrition is to support us as an organism so that we can help contain cancer cells. My question is regarding long-term surveillance in a very young um, uh, patient. So specifically a radiation exposure over a lifetime. So we've done MRIs, routine ultrasounds, and a chest x-ray. But the concern for us would be the chest x-ray isn't the same as a CT regarding kind of the lungs, keeping an eye on those. So um, we get this question a lot about the risks of surveillance, and um, uh, I do use a lot of MRIs in younger men and women, um, especially um, stratified by the intensity of the surveillance we require. So for example, someone with a low risk kidney cancer, which would be a stage one kidney cancer that's been completely removed, that patient probably needs two cross-sectional imaging studies, and if those are fine, they may not need anything else thereafter. But if someone has a higher risk cancer, say for example, kidney cancer that spread to the adrenal gland and we remove those, there's no other cancer deposits in that patient's body, but they're at very high risk for it coming back, that patient may get scans every three months for a couple of years. And so I kind of think about that. If it's just gonna be two CT scans and I'm confident that patient has a pretty strong chance of being cured, um, then I would not hesitate to do a CT scan. In general, we know that CT scans of the chest are better than chest x-rays for lung surveillance. But again, the sort of marginal benefit in someone with a lower risk kidney cancer is probably low, and I would probably just do a chest x-ray. In someone where their cancer has more aggressive features, then I would have a low threshold to do a chest CT. So if it were stage three? I would get a chest CT. Okay. And uh, I've never had a problem with insurance covering that. Any other questions? Thank you, everybody. Okay.